it was actually dealing with health matters, right? And the two areas that was the most funded by the legislature, okay, was health and education. Health because of the country's survival with the experiences of, of viruses, right? Cholera, measles, smallpox, right? Decimation of the population. So health was really important. And education was important for the health of the country, for maintaining this governing body, which is really important at that time. So you have all these factors or variables within the Hawaiian kingdom. And it wasn't just knowing your history. It was knowing so many different aspects of the, Hawaiian, of the country. And what best to bring back into the country. Now, what, what is foundational for people to know the country and what would be expected of people in the country is what is called national consciousness, right? National consciousness applies to a country, doesn't apply to a people, right? It refers to the country that they're in, which includes the political economy of the country, which includes the public health of the country, which includes the education of the country, which includes the economy, the trade. I mean, all of this, contributes to the national consciousness. Since the takeover, that national consciousness has been deliberately chiseled to where we barely know anything about our past. And we have to take classes like this <laughs> to relearn that past, right? And we're only talking like two or three generations that this has taken place. And we have to keep in mind that those that came here to control and deceive did it in order to maintain their position here, right? That's basically what happened. So when someone comes into your country and does not have the same national consciousness as the population, but rather comes from the national consciousness of an invader, right, of an occupier. In order to maintain their presence, they have to begin to do something. And naturally, what appears to have been hit the hardest was the governing body. the national consciousness of the people in knowing who they are. And another one is health, okay. Queens Hospital was established to ensure the well-being of the Aboriginal population because we were the ones hit the hardest, right? And that was important. And I have no doubt that after 1893, at some point, if the Hawaiian Kingdom was left to continue on its trajectory, it would have had universal health care for everyone. It is clear they would have done that, okay? Just as the Scandinavian countries, Norway, Sweden, and Finland, and areas of the, the, north, the northern part of Europe, their universal health care for all citizens it only started after World War II. Here's Hawaii's health care. Universal health care for the Aboriginal population started in 1859. So you can see and possibly predict that it would naturally get into providing health care for everyone. But in order to provide health care for everyone, you need to have an economy. You need to have a basis to bring in monies that can cover that, right? You see this a lot on on, on the news regarding the United States and Bernie Sanders, people keep asking, are you going to pay for universal health care for everyone? See, that's the bottom line. In the Hawaiian Kingdom, you already had that mechanism set up. Now, that mechanism that was set up is something that is called, in political science and law, 
a welfare state. Okay? Now, welfare state is not a derogatory term. A welfare state is an important aspect of a political economy of a country like the Hawaiian Kingdom. So the Scandinavian countries that provide universal health care, they're also called welfare states, not that everybody's on welfare. Welfare in the sense that it's, it's where the government's purpose is to seek the well-being or the welfare of its citizenry. That's what a welfare state is, okay? Now, in order to be a welfare state, you have to have centralized governmental control that does not impede competition, economics, promotes capitalism, but rather it directs it for the common good. It doesn't tell people how to trade. It encourages trade, but it also provides regulations, right? That is what people in America are calling socialism when in fact that's the wrong definition. <laughs> They're using a the wrong term. What Bernie Sanders has been talking about is a welfare state, not socialism. Two different terms, right? Now, in the Hawaiian Kingdom, you had it where the government can step in when there is a clear issue that has to be addressed. And in this particular case, health. So the Hawaiian Kingdom established the Board of Health in 1851, okay? In 1859, they established hospitals to include Queen's Hospital, right? And the funding for the hospital would be subsidized by the Hawaiian legislature. So they would actually allocate monies, match the funds that the hospital would raise privately, and that becomes the budget. Then you had a board of trustees, and the president of the board was the monarch, the head of state, the executive monarch. And half of the trustees were government officials. The other half were private. So that is what we call an infrastructure of a welfare state, where there can be times where government has to step in and address situations. One particular situation that it had to address was smallpox, okay? Now smallpox, did you know smallpox was not eradicated in the world until 1975, okay? So there was no vaccine that killed smallpox. The only thing that, could, that they could do in the Hawaiian kingdom was manage the crisis. They couldn't engage the crisis, but they had to manage it. Now, smallpox, like coronavirus, is, um, or COVID-19, is a virus, okay? So basically, a virus is not a bacterial. Virus is like a parasitic molecule, okay? And what it does is, it goes into the host body, and it attaches itself to cells and it replicates, right? So that's what a virus is, just like the movies, right? It's kind of like a spooky movie when you, when, you, when you talk about virus, right? It's not germs, okay? And virus, viruses can only live and survive in a body. So in the case of smallpox, smallpox, three out of 10 people contracted with smallpox would die. That was the statistics back then, uh, especially in the 19th century, because we're talking about the Hawaiian Kingdom. Yeah. Now, the way you deal with smallpox so that it doesn't transfer from body to body or person to person, you have to catch it and you have to contain it. And what they came up with was quarantine. Okay, so the Hawaiian Kingdom, actually had quarantine measures, actually quarantine regulations issued by the Board of Health, right? And the Board of Health actually was listed not just in the civil code, but it was also identified in the criminal code. Because if you violated certain provisions, 
of the regulations. You get thrown into hard labor for 12, 12 months and you get fined a lot of money. And we got to keep in mind the inflation calculator. Now, why are they so strong on this? Because Hawaii had experience of devastation, right? And you have to move quick on viruses. Otherwise, it spreads. That's why quarantine is so important. The fact that the Board of Health was so important, right? Health was so key, key in the Hawaiian Kingdom and the hospital was supported. I could imagine that if the Hawaiian Kingdom continued on its trajectory as its own country, we would have had scientists developed here. We would have had research. I mean, that's really where I could see it moving, right? And that's not just for health, but just politics and rights. And I mean, the Hawaiian Kingdom was really basically uh, stunted physically. So according to the census of 1890, 86% um, of the national population were Aboriginals, both pure and part. 14% were non-Aboriginals, which would have included Samuel Damon, Lauren Thurston, um, <laughs> Those of Chinese ancestry, Japanese ancestry. Yeah. So 86 That's pretty covered by pretty medical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also what's important is that when foreigners come to Hawaii, did you know that they had to pay a $2 uh, hospital tax, hospital fee? And that was to cover their health care when they're in Hawaii. And that's actually part of the Board of Health regulations. So any foreigner coming here, as a tourist, you gotta pay two dollars. And then recovered. recovered. Huh? And then they recovered for anything yep. that happened while they were here. Yep, they could access any healthcare facility throughout the islands. Wow. Yep. So you can see that that example as well is an indication of how far the Hawaiian Kingdom had the capacity to to reach out. And when you have the focus of health, you're not just protecting yourself, you're actually protecting everyone. Because when you protect everyone, you protect yourself, right? And uh, yeah, the Hawaiian Kingdom, I don't think I've ever heard of a tourist tax for healthcare in the 1800s. In fact, Lawrence Guncher, who's German, actually came across a book that was written by a German back in the 1870s or 1880s, and he would travel the world. He was a tourist, he would travel the world, and he spoke about the Hawaiian Kingdom collecting $2 for healthcare. And he said he's never seen that anywhere in the world, and it shows how progressive the Hawaiian Kingdom was. But this book was written all in German, <laughs> that's when Lawrence came across it. And that's when it directed him to go to the civil code. He went, hey, there's that law that that German tourist from the 1800s was referring to. But again, somebody from outside is speaking to the Hawaiian Kingdom and that body. But yet today, people, as we've covered in the past classes, view the Hawaiian Kingdom as some missionary controlled endeavor, right? And that natives didn't do anything, right? Um, uh, Gavin Dawes basically said, you know, in 1893, the native just let it happen, right? So these, these uh, anecdotes has definitely informed the psyche today, which we're going to get into is called denationalization. It's how you address the denationalization is the key, right? not how you blame people for denationalization. It's a given. We think this way, and it's not right. But we need to understand why we think this way, why it's not right, and what cor corrective measures we need to do to address it. And, and that's really where that, that, that all comes from. Um, the Hawaiian Kingdom is, I'm not painting all the good stuff. Some. There's some bad stuff too, but in any, in any country, you have bad stuff, right? But if you can put it within the country context, 
But if that bad stuff rises to, to the level of a crime, then take that person out, find him, her. Put that person, him or her, in jail as a punishment or response to that crime, right? It's not us against them. It's really, what do I do in the country? What is my role, right? Is my role in health? Is my role in law? Is my health, is my role in, in farming, in agriculture? Is my role in business? See, there's so many aspects of a country. And that's why all of this is called the national consciousness, right? When you limit it to a particular group of people, you limit an understanding of it, right? And that's why it's important. So even though Aboriginal Hawaiians constituted 86%, it, it doesn't also equate that they were in control to the exclusion of the 14%. Well, they're very inclusive. But in order to identify Aboriginals, both pure and part, the reason why that was really important wasn't because it was based upon race. It was actually tied to health. Because the census reports would determine whether or not the population of Aboriginal Hawaiians are increasing or decreasing. It's called statistics, right? But in the United States, race is politicized. And again, we tend to introduce that into our lens now when we look into our past. So when they start to see the trajectory of the Aboriginal population, they saw that it was definitely increasing. And Commandment IV, he was the one that started to encourage migration from foreigners, right? Especially Chinese to marry into the Aboriginal population to increase the race, right? Possibly to incre increase an immune system, right? And then he was also encouraging Polynesians to come. So it wasn't a matter of being pure or part. If anything, being part Aboriginal, Kappa, was important for the statistics to show it's increasing. So the whole point here wasn't increasing pure bloods, because that's a racial kind of deriving from the United States politics. This was proof that the Aboriginal population is increasing. You know. Any questions? You guys good? Okay. So let me. Uh, sorry, Keanu. Keanu, sorry. Um, what other countries has that perspective when they look at um, expanding their their um, their group, you know, their dominant group and whatnot? As an example, um, as far as yeah, marrying into other, so that you can um, using the the hapa, having them, you know and then increasing their their group um, the only examples that I had would be the those with ill intent <laughs> in promoting their group <laughs> it's called racism yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Apartheid. so so there's the negative side yeah 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 to to what our people did back then but see, our people back then were not racist. And you could see that in a Willie Kauai's dissertation. Now, racism is important. Now, racism is institutionalized prejudice. Okay, you guys caught that? Racism is institutionalized prejudice. Okay. So, so somebody can be prejudiced, prejudging someone. But if those people that prejudge people come into power, they will institute rules to, 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 to activate that prejudice. And that's what we call racism, okay? In the Hawaiian kingdom, there was no racism. 
because government and regulations was not developed but from a prejudice. It was developed through ali'i, ali'i anna, and then also through morals and ethics, right? Be, uh, good behavior, right? Now, once racism began in Hawaii, does anybody know when racism began, where they actually curtailed uh, participation in government because of race, right? So an example would be like in uh, the South, the Jim Crow laws. Okay, Jim Crow laws basically are racist laws that would prevent Blacks after the Civil War from participating in voting and government. It was a way to control them, right? And it was directed toward a particular race and people. In the Hawaiian Kingdom, when did racism begin? When do you guys think racism begin? Because you start to see it in government policies and law. Anybody? In the Constitution? Yeah. That's a law, right? Being a Constitution. Well, an aspect of a law. It's actually a treasonous document. <laughs> but what they did there was that they prevented. Chinese from voting. Giant Chinese were excluded. Even Chinese who were Hawaiian, Hawaiian subjects, they were excluded from voting because these individuals who had prejudice, like Sanford Dole and Lauren Thurston, they learned that in the East, on the East Coast when they attended colleges, right? Tom Kaufman covers that in Nation Within, right? And they brought back that prejudice, which they learned through institutionalized prejudice called racism in the United States, and Aryan superiority, and also Sinophobia. You guys know what Sinophobia is? Remember the Russia-Sino War? Russia-Chinese War. <laughs> so Sinophobia is uh, uh, prejudice against Chinese people. And that's what you had in the United States. And that's why when the building of the railroads, the majority of the workers were Chinese. And Americans who were not Chinese began to suffer from this sinophobia, like, uh, they, they're invading our country, they're taking our jobs away. Doesn't that sound familiar, <laughs> right? That's what was going on in the United States. And did you know that Chinatowns that are throughout the United States, it's not because the Chinese chose to live there. They couldn't live anywhere else. That was part of segregation. So naturally the Chinese couldn't do business with non-Chinese, so they had to do it amongst themselves, and thus what was developed was Chinatowns, right? So today when you go eat dim sum, well, there's a lot of history behind that Chinatown of where you're at. Now the common misunderstanding is Chinatown in Hawaii as opposed to Chinatowns in the United States. So the first time the use of the word Chinatown or Tauna Pake was actually um, written in 1885, I believe, 1885. But when they referred to Tauna Pake or Chinatown in downtown Honolulu, it was referring to the Chinese market, not the Chinatown of segregation, right? So once those in 1887, those insurgents stepped up and started to assert their power, right? Which initiated the revolution. The question is whether or not they're successful, right? But they initiated the revolution. They were bringing in these, prejud these prejudices and institutionalized them to now make it racism. And they uh, eventually began to create the Chinatowns of the United States 
in the Chinatown of downtown Honolulu after 1893. And then you get into, um, uh, what do you call it? You get into uh, um, the plague, the bubonic plague of 1899 in what is known today as Chinatown. That's when you start to see statements made by those in the so-called Republic, uh, especially uh, Emerson, who was a member of the Board of Health. They started referring to them as the Chinese plague. Right. So, so again, you have to know where to separate the American national consciousness, both the good, the bad, and the ugly, from the Hawaiian national consciousness. And it's possible good, the bad, and the ugly. But once you start to conflate the two, then it gets blurry. Right. So that's, that, that's important to also know. Racism. Okay. Did I answer that question in the beginning before we let into this? Earl? Yeah, yeah, that was a good, much better understanding. Okay, good. So Hawaii is very unique. Yeah. That it wasn't promoting Aboriginals to the exclusion of others, it was promoting Aboriginals because of health. <laughs> they yeah. needed statistics to see if their policies are working that that's that's what it is to see if their lawmaking is working you need stats and the census reports were very important to to determine whether or not the aboriginal population is recovered so here's the board of health that was established in 1851 okay and They actually served without pay, but these positions were envied. <laughs> you know, it's like to be on the board of health is to be highly regarded in the country, right? Now, what we also have here is the board of health laid out in the civil code and that was as of 1859 which then went into 1884 called the compound laws and one part that i want to show here is uh section 294 so it says notice shall be given of such quarantine regulations by publication in the manner provided in section 284 and after such notice have been given any person who shall violate any such quarantine regulations shall be fined a sum not less than five, no more than $500. Now, if you apply the inflation calculator to that, that's, that's, that's pretty heavy, okay? Now, what I found interesting is, well, 18, uh, section 284. So regulations have to be published in the paper, right, before people can be held accountable. So here's an example of a publication. And this was in, I believe, the Hawaiian Gazette in 1891, during the time of Queen Lilipo Kalani. So you notice it says, Quarantine Regulations for the Hawaiian Kingdom, 1891, Board of Health Notice. So basically, uh, You have uh, how many? You have 23 regulations that deal with vessels coming into Hawaii, right? This would also be considered planes <laughs> coming to Hawaii if planes existed at that time. And what you have is a pilot. So a pilot is what allows a ship to come into the harbor, okay, and escorts them to be moored. Uh, a pilot would be uh, somebody within the airline industry that would allow the landing of the planes, right? 
So pretty heavy regulations. What it does is it gives full discretion to the Board of Health to call it. But they have to go on, on each, on incoming ships and the ship captain or the captain of an airplane has to make a sworn statement that there are no diseases on the plane, no viruses, right? Now, section 297, if any master, seaman, or passenger belonging to any vessel on board of which any affection may then be, or may have lately been, or suspect, suspected to have been, or which may have been at, or which may have come from any port where any infectious distemper prevailed, that may then endanger the public health, shall refuse to make answer on oath to such questions as may be asked him relating to such infection or distemper by the Board of Health or its agents, such master, seamen, or passengers so refusing shall be punished by a fine not exceeding $500 or imprisonment at hard labor not exceeding 12 months or both in the discretion of the court. Now, $500 is huge. When you apply. So you guys can check that. Inflation calculator, you can Google it. Type in $500, what would it be in 1893? <laughs> okay. And then you'll see how much that is. But especially hard labor for 12 months, that gives you an idea that the fine must be almost the same uh, feeling of, of pain, right? Now it also says, all expenses incurred on account of any person, vessel or goods under any quarantine regulation shall be paid by such person, vessel or owner of such vessel or goods respectively. Hmm. That means people who come here, they gotta, they gotta pay for their own quarantine. Should be covered by the Hawaiian government, but your healthcare would be taken care of. But the quarantine is what you gotta cover. Wouldn't that be a pretty awesome um, uh, provision in today's quarantine with the foreigners, tourists coming in that are violating the quarantine? So there's a lot in the Hawaiian kingdom that you can actually learn, but it's not that you may see this as strict. Because of Hawaiian experience, it had to be strict. That's the key. It had to be strict because of the public health. Notice public health, not native health. <laughs> it's everything. Now, I also want to show you uh, another newspaper article, and I'll send it. To, I'll, I'll upload it on the on the drive. There is in 1881. There was a breakout of smallpox. Okay. And the Board of Health did not move as fast as they were supposed to. So here in the Pacific Commercial Advertiser, there was a meeting at Kalmakapili Church. And they basically are coming up and they're discussing the failure of the Board of Health to respond quickly because smallpox was introduced when it should have been stopped. And instead of quarantining the rich people that were on the ship that were above deck, they only quarantined those that were below deck, meaning that was an oversight. So here's the Kamakapili Church putting these resolutions together and basically saying, giving the history of smallpox in Hawaii, and how they were scared of it. Remember, three out of 10 people would die who contracted. But it also gives you the, 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 the push and the pull of Hawaii politics, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly. The point is Hawaii has experience in this. And that's why in 1891, those provisions, those regulations were made much stricter. Right? So you did have participation from, from the people. 